We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everybody. Uh, the, the few, the bold uh, people who have joined us. I see 10 people in the room, and hopefully there will be more later. We'll see how that goes. Um, I am William Drake from Columbia University, formerly University of Zurich, uh, and here in Geneva, as you can see behind me. Um, this is a hybrid one-hour session. Some of us are in Poland, as you see Martina, and others of us are in our pajamas, uh, no names uh, will be mentioned. Uh, thanks to Martina for organizing. Uh, as indicated in the session description, um, this session engages with policy questions central to the governance of global digital trade and data flows over the internet, and hence uh, issues that are central to internet governance. As digital trade has grown massively in recent years, governments around the world have been working to put in place national approaches and in parallel engaging in international regime negotiations in a variety of uh, bilateral, regional, plurilateral free trade agreements, as well as in the World Trade Organization. And as always happens when new trade processes and issues arise, some governments and stakeholders have sought to shield their markets from international competition through a variety of restrictive measures, uh, while others have uh, decried these things as being uh, contrary to the spirit and letter of international trade agreements. A uh, major barrier to reconciling divisions of view in this way, uh, realm uh, has always been the lack of comprehensive and updated analyses and indicators regarding such policies and practices uh, that restrict trade uh, that can be meaningfully compared across jurisdictions. So we can have a macro level view of the state of play, how open or closed to flows of digital products and services is the global digital economy at any given time, et cetera. Um, and absent such analyses and indicators, governments and stakeholders may misconstrue their national capabilities and interests, uh, trade negotiators, may face great uncertainty as to how to bargain and problem solve, and collective governance efforts may be impeded. So if we look at the history of international cooperation, it's been well demonstrated that under conditions of complexity and uncertainty, new ideas and information have often proved to be causal and indeed essential to helping to clarify uh, actors' thinking and interests and to map paths forward. In this connection, uh, the expertise, credibility, and independence of uh, actors advancing new ideas and information have been key uh, to the reception of, of their messages. So we've seen this over the, the years in fields that intersect with the digital trade of today, whether it's uh, trade and services, internet governance, or data flows. And uh, today we see that a number of industry associations, international organizations, research institutes, think tanks, analysts, and governments and others have been assembling analyses and indicators on policies affecting the digital economy and analyzing their effects. Uh, however, to date, as I say, there's been inadequate coordination and structured comparison of the evidence between these efforts. So this session seeks to advance that process of coordination, uh, kind of building uh, the epistemic community of people who are uh, involved in the field of digital trade and our collective knowledge base uh, in order to try to facilitate more effective uh, international cooperation around digital trade issues. Uh, today, we're going to talk about four initiatives in particular, the Digital Policy Alert from the University of St. Gallen uh, Endowment for Prosperity Through Trade, the Regional Di Digital Trade Restrictiveness Index by the UN SCAP, the Digital Trade Policy Project in Africa by the UN ECA, and the Digital Trade Integration Project by the European University Institute, the Hurdy School and the London School of Economics and Bochani University. These initiatives all provide open access data which can, be proved, which can prove to be valuable tools for researchers and policymakers, practitioners, et cetera, in shedding, lights, uh, shedding light on the regulations of the digital economy and trying to identify gaps and uh, possible good practices going forward. We have four speakers uh, uh, who will talk about the initiatives they're involved in, and uh, I'll introduce them in the order in which they'll be speaking. And I apologize in advance for any mispronunciations. Uh, we will have uh, Johannes Fritz, CEO of the St. Gallen Endowment for Prosperity Through Trade, 
Wetada Anukun Wataka, says that wrong, Senior Economic Affairs Officer and Trade Policy in the Trade Policy and Facilitation Section on Trade Investment and Innovation Division at the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific. Uh, she coordinates the Regional Digital Integration Project at UNSCAP. Uh, Jeffrey Gupi, uh, Associate Economic Affairs Officer at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, UNECA, um, and Martina Farrakhan, the Max Weber Fellow at the European University Institute. She manages the Digital Trade Initiative along with Professor Bernard Hopin. Martina also will be serving as the online moderator today, replacing Anna Abramova, who unfortunately is unable to be with us. And we have as a rapporteur, Alan P. Alex. Each of the speakers will uh, talk for a little under eight minutes each in order to leave room uh, at the end for open discussion among all participants. And so we're hoping uh, that uh, despite uh, having a small last day crowd, that we can have a vibrant and interesting discussion around the issues of how do we gather and share and compare knowledge and information data about trade practices that impact the extent and uh, character of trade integration around the world and uh, that impact the ability of governments and other stakeholders to reach agreements on the governance of digital trade. So I think this is an important topic and I hope that we'll be able to hear a lot of different views expressed about it. That's the game plan. Uh, so we'll go through the four presentations and we'll have open discussion among all participants. And when we do that, of course, we ask that everybody identify themselves clearly and stick to one to two minutes in, in their interventions so that everybody can speak. Okay, so that's the setup, and now we begin. Uh, Johannes, uh, you are first up. Would you like to tell us about your initiative? My con. So hello, uh, fellow participants in Katowice. I greet you from the snowy Alps. My name is Johannes. I represent the St. Gallen Endowment, which is a Swiss uh, charitable nonprofit that seeks to promote transparency and international policy choice and democratize access to such data um, around the world. We are best known for our oldest initiative, which is the Global Trade Alert. It's been running for 12 years and collected over 40,000 pieces of information based on official sources that people can dig into on a public database. And earlier this year, we launched our newest initiative, which is, is I'm excited to speak to you about here today, which is the Digital Policy Alert. And we formulated the digital policy alert based on two worries, uh, uh, but then two, two observations and one worry. We observe that there's lots of activity in the digital space about regulating and policy, policy making that affects the digital economy. And at the same time, we observe that there is no publicly accessible inventory that is timely created and tracks all this activity. And based on those two observations, we worry that there is a risk of fragmenting the internet, um, stories like um, Chinese shipping data not getting out across the world and people don't know where their uh, good physical goods are. Similar issues around the GDPR where merchants are worried to contract with Europeans because they may become liable uh, over here, overseas. Such stories tell us about broader risks that businesses worry about compliance costs when entering a new market. And the flip side of it is that consumers worldwide, particularly in small markets and, and less purchasing power markets, may lose out on really the benefits that the internet promises for us all as a borderless area for doing, for exchanging ideas and commerce. And so we, what we brought it, to help mitigate this risk, what we as the digital policy alert try to do is bring in a data set that is timely and creates a public inventory for everybody to use. And we bring it out in two distinct data products. The first one we call, we launched it this year in April is an activity tracker where we want to allow all stakeholders really to engage early so that you don't need your own policy department to make your voice heard, that you can see what's going on in the digital space that you can act on and get in, get your voice heard before a law is passed, before a regulation is finally adopted. As early as we can get it to you, we'll make it available to you and get you a notification in if you're so inclined. And the second data product is more going into detail. We call it a detailed mapping, which is about making the, um, dissecting laws into the, the relevant, relevant details, dissecting orders into what, where the main differences are so our users can freely compare such laws across time and across space, figuring out really where um, 
choice differs across the planet, um, what, how these differences play out in the real world and what they may or may not want to do about it. And so we've been running with the activity tracker since April this year for a couple of months now. And we have some findings that I want to share with you today. We have currently tracked around a thousand such policy or regulatory changes um, for the G20 and the European member states, but Switzerland for now. This is our launch data set, if you will. And if you look at the, the just the 700 activities that we tracked for this year alone, so 700 policy changes that were proposed or implemented this year in these countries, we see lots of activity, obviously in the big trading blocks, the United States and Europe, um, but also elsewhere. Uh, in these big blocks, there is a bit of a difference between the center and the decentralized action. So in Europe, the European Commission works much on data governance, but also on, you probably heard the regulation of artificial intelligence, what algorithms may or may not do and under what circumstances. On the decentralized level, in the member states, we see issues around um, content moderation, but also taxation, the taxation of the digital services, but also on e-commerce, they become more active here in Europe. In the United States also essentially is more worried about data governance, but also um, competition, competition areas, as we'll see on the next slide. It's also a really big center of activity and the states, the, 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 the different states in the United States do uh, also start moving on the tax front and um, privacy protection is also not a federal issue at the United States, but also more of a decentralized state level issue. The United States and the US and EU are obviously not the only actors we have. As you see, there's lots going on uh, in China and Canada, where we have issues around uh, big, uh, an ambitious content moderation law in Canada. We see um, the bargaining uh, power between small and large media actors negotiated in the Australia in Australia and other really salient developments, uh, mostly around competition, data governments and the like. And if I break this up, I talk about these different policy fields, which we all try to capture as a digital policy alert. We try to take the most comprehensive view possible going from data governance regulation, content moderation, taxation, but also issues like, uh, like foreign direct investment or any service access and operation requirements. We try to get them in. And if I break this up by these broad areas, what we'll see for 2021 is that we have really these five blocks that are highly active, the data governance, competition, content moderation, taxation, and operational issues. And data governance takes the cake by far. This is where we see the most activity and fortunately also where coordination is on the way, although not far enough. As you probably have heard, we try to get multilateral co cooperation on, on digital economy issues at WTO, at the World Trade Organization in the so-called joint statement initiative where they try to formulate a common text that the governments around the world can agree to on what they want to do with regulating the transfer of data say, but there's much to do and there's still a lot of um, national le level action that is currently outside of the scope of that initiative. And other things that we find very interesting as the digital policy alert are for instance competition, which is not much of a development issue per se, but raises very, very important or dicey questions like, for instance, who is responsible for enforcing competition in the global economy? If there's, you know, Facebook merges with Giphy, which are two American companies, but now European regulators want to intervene and say, well, they also affect our markets here. And so something that you had classically in competition law, where it was much about where the companies are located, no longer applies. And it's also kind of hard to say, you know, when do we get in as, uh, as regulators about competition, because usually we are as regulators all about consumer surplus so that the consumers are not ripped off, which is very hard as a comp concept to work in much of the digital economy. And so they have to think about how really, where to start as a competition enforcement agency and where to stop. And we also see, it's just like content moderation where the whole issue about harmful speech, you know, this gray area between, elite, uh, between illegal speech and free speech harmful speech, what is this? Where does this begin? It's a discussion that reminds us very much of, you know, broadcasting legislation where what you see in television varies greatly on the different countries and continents. And similar, we see the different national tastes and what is permissible content and what isn't. And yeah, finally, um, an interesting area for us is also taxation, where you probably have heard of the OECD's attempt to um, get a um, global minimum corporate income tax. And this is heavily related to the digital economy because there are a bunch of uh, countries around the world that have already proposed a so-called digital service tax, which is a tax on any digitally provided service. 
um, that you provide in a country, like if you sell a, a, a streaming product to a Canadian that the Canadian government would tax you for that. And there are a bunch of those that are already implemented, but currently not enforced. And they all hinge on this promise by the OECD uh, accord that governments will pull in a, mi a global minimum tax uh, in 2023. And so until we have that, there's a standstill for now on such digital service taxes, at least in Europe and in Canada. And so we'll see how that play out because it will be an important part of how we regulate the digital economy. So what I want to impress to you is we are building this new data set. I hope you find it interesting. Um, there's much to come and I would be grateful if you keep engaging with us. You can get to me at the digitalpolicyalert.org website. Stay tuned for our new version that's coming in the first quarter and our first report really coming out in the second part of the year. If you want to reach me, here's my address and I'm really look forward to your many comments in the discussion now. Thanks, I give it back to you, William. Thank you, Johannes. that was perfect and right on time. So uh, excellent and very interesting. Um, okay, uh, let's go to Mitada, are you there and ready to go? Yes, Bill. Uh, Hi. Thank Hi, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Thank you. Uh, I'm with Hada Anupul Mataka from uh, Trade, Investment and Innovation Division of ASCAP. Um, what I would like to, to show you today is, is one of our initiatives that uh, we're looking at digital economy integration for Asia Pacific region. And uh, we work in collaboration with, with uh, the European University Institute as well as uh, OECD to, to take uh, and collect data uh, for building tools to support policymakers. Uh, what, what the collaborations here that we have with the, the uh, OECD and um, European University is actually lead us to, to have uh, background information that feed into a bigger, uh, a bigger tools. Uh, we call it uh, Digital and Sustainable Regional Integration Index, which is uh, uh, an index capturing performance of Asia Pacific regions in their regional integration not only uh, digital economy, but actually there are seven dimensions that we are looking into it. Uh, trade investment, finance, regional value chains, infrastructure, movement of people, regulatory corporations, and of course, uh, the, the important one, especially for the 21st century is the digital economy integration. Uh, in, in our DC3 framework here, uh, when we're looking at uh, regional integration, we have we try to address not only the performance of countries in Asia Pacific regions in terms of uh, standard way of integration, but we try to also address uh, sustainable development perspective. Uh, so you could see in our frameworks that there is in conventional integration part and sustainable integration part. And these two parts has uh, uh, indicators within it that used in complementary to each other to reflect both efficiency and uh, sustainability of uh, how the region perform. Talking specifically into digital economy integration is where uh, our uh, initiative, initiative on digital trade regulatory restrictiveness measurements is fitting in because uh, through the assumptions that openness and harmonization of digital trade regulations in the regions would allow uh, interoperability and uh, pave the way for better uh, regional digital trade integrations. We conduct uh, data collection in collaboration with, with uh, partners that I mentioned, and uh, we establish uh, the RDTII index. And we use that index as the information, as one of the information that fit into DC3. Under DC3 framework uh, on digital economic integration, 
to, to put things simply, uh, we group our measurements under these domains into four clusters. Uh, trade and regulation is where the RDTI, Regional Digital Trade Regulatory Index, is fitting in. Apart from these uh, regulatory indicators, the, the cluster also look into how digital goods and service trade flows in the regions are performed, how tariff is, is changed on these products and how progress the region makes in e-commerce penetration. So all of these uh, sub subdomains is putting together and give us information to, to talk about performance of the regions in terms of trade and regulatory uh, integration. Apart from this domain, the digital also capture performance in infrastructure connectivities that relevant to, to digital trade. Uh, not only hard infrastructures like ICT, but also soft infrastructure like finance infrastructure. These two uh, clusters is what we call conventional measurements. Uh, when I were saying we also taking care of sustainability of the integration, and that is reflected in the second part of this framework, which is the inclusive part and security part. Uh, talking about inclusiveness, uh, we try to proxy them. It's not perfect, but we try to capture inclusive access to, to core infrastructure like internet, uh, finance infrastructures, and uh, inclusive of e-commerce penetration when we look into um, not only the, the, the population percentage of population access to internet, but look into how proportionate it is when, when compared between the majority and minority group of people. So cybersecurity, uh, the proxy that we use right now, uh, is, this is still the, the ongoing initiative. So uh, we, we are still revising indicators when, when we found better data. So uh, this is just the, the preliminary one. The cybersecurity, uh, now we use secure internet server as, as one of the proxies there. Just to give you a snapshot of what we found. Um, the regions, uh, based on these two measurements, as you may expect, Asia Pacific is very diverse. We have very advanced country and very uh, small and low income countries put together. Right? So diverse performance is, is what, what uh, you would expect. But, uh, more interesting is also when when we compare conventional index with sustainable index, uh, many countries has uh, much more modest performance in terms of sustainability of the integration. And often uh, this country like least developed country or landlocked developed country are lagging behind not only in terms of infrastructures, but also in terms of regulations that, that they apply. There are two groups of them uh, for these uh, poor low income country. One group go into overly regulate and the other group go into not sufficiently regulate. So uh, both of them, sit, uh, both groups sitting in two different ends of the spectrum when it's come to restrictiveness. Uh, they also have this advantage in terms of uh, business environment and other things that make them difficult to, to participate in digital uh, goods value chains and not be able to attract uh, FDI, which supposed to, to bring them uh, capital that they lack or technology that they lack and leapfrog to, to the uh, higher level of development. And this gap is, is locked in digital domain when compared to other regional integration uh, measurements. Uh, if you remember, we have seven dimensions. So when compared to 
uh, trade, investment, or uh, other areas of regional integration. Digital economy integration, the gaps between these uh, large and small countries become uh, more significant. So, uh, having said that, I, I, I still um, encourage you to, to look more into the publications. Uh, I give link in, in my first slide uh, to the registry to, to see more in depth on what we do there and uh, how we can use the information uh, from registry with uh, deep, deep, you can dig deeper into uh, regulatory similarity of Asia Pacific regions. And uh, we have the data sets available and we are actually uh, upgrade it to the second versions, which uh, we expect to release uh, early next year and uh, more analysis based on what we found in, in these tools will, will come along. Uh, one of that is the Asia Pacific Digital Trade Regulatory Report that we will be launching uh, in, in uh, a month or so. And uh, for SCAP, our priority is uh, three things. First, we establish evidence which uh, not only SCAP are doing uh, the initiative in OECD, in uh, European University, uh, and uh, what you will hear in, in these workshops also provide evidence. But using this evidence, we use it to build capacity for policymakers to support the reform of the policy. So uh, the framework that we develop will be fit into our training materials, our capacity building workshops, and technical assistance that we engage with uh, country in Asia Pacific. Uh, it used also to support the uh, negotiations, uh, capacity be established platform like uh, trade negotiation advisors that bridge the gaps between research evidence that we collect and our partner collects and use them to become a tools for advising where is the weak point of uh, policy across across different areas and uh, compare it with, with their uh, concerned parties when they have to go to negotiation tables so, so they know where they are and where their uh, peers are. So that, that's all for, for uh, the SCAP initiatives that I would like to introduce to you today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Matanda. That was very interesting. Um, may I ask, uh, just because this is a short session and we want to make sure that we have enough time for uh, open discussion that the other panelists uh, keep an eye on the chat and I will let you know when you reach the eight minute mark, um, at which point it would be good to start to wind down. Um, okay, so let's turn next to Jeffrey. Jeffrey, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Many thanks, uh, okay. uh, Will. I will try to be uh, short. <laughs> uh, but let me share my screen. Uh, Okay, I think, is it shared? Yes. Yes, yeah, it's okay. Good. Many thanks, many thanks. Okay, so I'm Geoffrey Guépier. I work for uh, Economic Commission for Africa, for the United Economic Commission for Africa, and um, I'm actually engaged in our digital trade uh, initiative. And so um, just to say that, um, Considering the importance that uh, digital trade is gaining in the world, but also the challenge associated with its quantification, its uh, measurements, uh, our commission launched in the same way as uh, ESCAP, um, a digital trade regulatory and regression uh, initiative uh, toward the end of uh, 2020. And this initiative have, have uh, the, the main objective of assessing the readiness of um, of African countries to effectively engage in uh, digital trade and 
uh, and e-commerce uh, uh, in e-commerce. And this initiative uh, come at uh, at a time when uh, the third phase of negotiation of the AFCFT, the FCFT, I mean uh, African uh, Continental Free Trade Area. So it's come uh, at the third phase of the negotiation of uh, the AFCFTA, focusing on e-commerce. And we, it is very important as we want to also participate in this uh, negotiation and give some uh, indications, give some policy recommendation to, uh, to negotiators. In concrete terms, the initiative begin uh, with a training component uh, and a, a training and research component where selected national experts are given the tools uh, to, co to collect and compile data on digital trade. The data is collected uh, at, a, at a national uh, level to inform uh, two separate databases. The first one is digital service trade restriction and the second one is uh, digital trade integration i want just to mention that in digital service trade restriction we work together with oecd and in uh, digital trade integration we work together with uh, european university uh, and closely with martina which is who is uh, who is there so and uh, the information collect through this uh, through this initiative may have multiple use. The first one, which is very important for us, is uh, to assisting member states uh, on digital trade issue at large and on e-commerce, uh, particularly in the context of uh, the AFCFTA negotiation. The second one, also interesting, is to expand the coverage of African uh, country in OECD uh, Digital Service Trade Restrictiveness Index. Before our initiative, the only um, only African country which was covered was uh, South Africa. So now we want to expand it uh, to uh, to the 28 country that we are um, that we are analyzing uh, during this in, uh, initiative. And if the third use is will be to build uh, a regional digital trade integration index for uh, for Africa because we have already an integration which an index sorry which measure uh, regional trade integration in Africa and to have the world picture of regional trade integration we want to add with this initiative we want to add a digital component to uh, this index. Uh, to this index also. And of course, data will be uh, publicly available for anyone interested uh, to make analyses uh, on digital trade and data will be uh, publicly available through a dedicated uh, a platform. So now let's focus on the two uh, databases that we collect and also uh, share with you the key, the key fed finding that uh, we have from now. So the first one is uh, the data related to digital service trade restriction. Uh, uh, so the information collected uh, was used to construct an index of uh, restrictiveness of trade in digital services for each country that we cover. And in the graph, you, you will see the, some of the country that uh, we cover because the initiative is still ongoing and we have not all the 28 countries that we cover. So this is the sample that we have for, from now. And the result is, is uh, instead uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, the, the, the main result, uh, the first result and uh, striking first message that, uh, that is highlighted with uh, this graph is that uh, uh, most of the African uh, countries have reduced restrictive measures to digital trade. If you take the example of Uganda, for example, Uganda, which is here, we see from uh, uh, 2014 to now how the variation is a very uh, is very big. Uh, if you compare Uganda to to Zambia, for example, you will see that there was at the same level uh, in 2014, and now we see the so you, you can appreciate very well the, the variation uh, in in Uganda, in Uganda and in most of the country in our in our sample. Also, one interesting result is that uh, uh, main restriction to digital trade across African countries uh, found in infrastructure. And uh, in this infrastructure pillars, 
we it's on compass data protection and also uh, over infrastructure requirement where we have uh, uh, interconnection uh, between um, internet operators or, or cell phone operators and uh, also interesting to note in a further result is that country uh, that have a high restriction score for intellectual property in red intellectual property rights and electronic transaction are generally not party uh, to international agreements and this give a message the message that uh, indicate that sorry regulation should uh, ensure balanced protection of uh, intellectual property and property rights holders so uh, the fact to ratify uh, international agreement will ensure balanced protection whether we are uh, whether uh, the holder of intellectual property rights are local or are or come from uh, abroad. And now let's turn on the results from uh, the digital integration uh, uh, data that we, we collect. And concerning this uh, preliminary results show uh, that African countries are relatively integrated in terms of digital uh, trade. Law and legislation do not discriminate between digital trade relevant sectors and over sectors. We can take the example of FDA, FDI, sorry, for example, uh, where uh, in all countries that we analyze, we see that uh, in digital trade relevant sector, uh, whether in digital trade relevant, relevant sector or, or not, uh, FDI is subject to, this, to the same criteria. And also second result, which is interesting, is that many countries surveyed uh, lack legislative framework in, in, in core digital area, like data protection, cross-border transfer, and uh, consumer protect, protection law. Here also we can uh, multiply the example, uh, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Tanzania, for example, do not, do not have a legislative or comprehensive framework for data protection. Uh, if you take, uh, for example, Tanzania, they have not a consumer uh, uh, protection law and many countries that we cover have not, uh, you know, some consumer protection law, there are many law related to uh, digital trade. And also further result interesting is about digital uh, trade transaction, which is uh, high in, in some uh, country. So this uh, let us conclude that uh, 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 it is important to have harmonized rule and regulation uh, uh, across Africa, especially when it comes to uh, cross-border transfer, uh, transfer data. Also, we can say that uh, after this analysis that the emergence of a climate of, of trust is very important. And also here, uh, consumer protection regulation could help to, um, to increase this uh, confidence in terms of uh, digital trade um, environment in Africa. And of course, many other uh, um, big issues uh, need to be uh, clarified in terms of regulation, uh, data governance, IPA, liberalization of good and services sector, which are important for e-commerce also need to have a, 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 look, a look. So uh, I will um, hand here and say that uh, the initiative is still ongoing and we will uh, get more results, of course. Uh, but which is very interesting and it is, is highlighted here is that a regulation is um, in Africa need to be um, how to say to be look clearly to to uh, open uh, trade in digital services. Many thanks. Thank you very much. That was very interesting and a lot of good uh, good data and evidence from the African. Uh, Case. Okay. Uh, finally, we have Martina. Martina, would you yes. like to? Yes. Thanks, Bill. Um, well, for me, it's extremely interesting to see the results of these studies because uh, like you can really see how diverse uh, countries uh, can be in uh, different in the different regions we, we have looked at, and uh, uh, this shows that there is a lot of work to do to clarify uh, also what policies can be implemented to be more digitally trade integrated. Um, well, uh, on my side, I just wanted to start by saying that uh, we are here at the Internet Governance Forum, a UN uh, forum on internet governance, and I have uh, 
uh, heard the word the trade very, very few times. And uh, it's surprising because uh, when um, we discuss here platform regulation, data regulation, uh, content moderation, uh, all issues which are now being discussed in trade agreements, countries are taking commitments on this in trade agreements, uh, but still uh, at this forum often there is not enough space uh, and interest in a, in a topic which is affecting uh, greatly uh, internet governance. Uh, but well, uh, oh, starting uh, from this uh, um, introduction, I, I, is, I move to the presentation of our project which connects a bit uh, um, the the project we heard before in different ways uh, and this is a project which we have uh, launched in July at the European University Institute uh, which aims to uh, map um, digital trade uh, policies and create an index. Um, so before presenting the project I want to um, quickly uh, present the other three initiatives which are uh, which exist at the uh, global level on, on this topic. Uh, there is uh, the uh, DTRI initiative at ESIP, uh, which I will uh, present in a moment. Uh, the digital SCRI, which uh, is an OECD initiative uh, that uh, um, we heard about before, uh, because uh, uh, the UN is now helping to expand the coverage of this uh, index. And then there is the uh, policy, uh, digital policy alert that we already heard from uh, uh, by uh, Johannes. So uh, just quickly, in terms of what are the results and the information we have on these uh, uh, initiatives, on one end, uh, the DTRI, which is an index developed at ESIP, which now has been discontinued. Uh, so this is also a reason why we are starting our new initiative. Uh, this was the first initiative uh, to try to map measures affecting digital trade and uh, that attempted to create an index. Uh, this was done a few years ago in 2018. And uh, this initiative covered 64 countries and uh, by creating an open database, which today is still uh, being used uh, by um, um, academics and also international organizations, um, by creating this database, it was possible to create uh, an index. Uh, all the methodology is available online. And uh, this index gave a very uh, clear picture for the first time <laughs> on the level of restrictiveness uh, the countries had on digital trade. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it was... Uh, uh, easy to, to spot uh, China, Russia and India as the main countries imposing restrictions on digital trade, while uh, New Zealand, Iceland, Norway, Hong Kong are all countries uh, that were found to be very uh, imposing very uh, few restrictions. And by lo looking at the map, uh, in just in terms of number of measures, so without waiting, uh, putting weights or scores, um, can again see India, China, uh, uh, and but also Germany, France, imposing a lot of measures that have an impact on digital trade. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, countries like uh, Australia um, and again uh, New Zealand imposing a few restrictions. The OECD initiative, which is more recent, um, um, is uh, an expansion of uh, their SCRI index uh, to, go to have a digital uh, pillar. And uh, it covered... It covers less countries. I think it's about uh, 35, but thanks to the UN now, they are expanding their scope, so they will probably get to 60 or so. Um, and this is an initiative which focuses on services only, um, and uh, on in particular in four areas, um, uh, so infrastructure, payments, IP, um, and uh, here again, they create an index. Uh, all the information about the index is available online. And uh, if we just look at the number of measures that they find, the, um, the picture is very similar to the other initiative uh, from ESIP. Uh, again, we find uh, uh, China, India, Russia imposing a lot of measures. Uh, but when it comes to the EU, uh, they find much uh, more measures in Eastern Europe compared to the previous initiative, which uh, found more measures in France and Germany. This is just to give a picture of what is out there. Uh, and of course, then there is the digital uh, policy alert, very recently launched. Uh, Johannes already said everything about it, and is mainly uh, an exercise to map more measures, but uh, doesn't have any uh, then analysis and trying to create an index out of those measures. Uh, but is a very helpful tool to find information, um, which is uh, implemented uh, at the global level. 
So in practice, we have uh, a first initiative, which has been discontinued, another initiative, which covers uh, all the services, uh, and uh, a third initiative, which, has, which maps measures. So we thought that there was the need to do more and to work further on uh, uh, measuring the impact of, this, of those uh, policies. And, uh, and this is important for different reasons. Uh, first of all, we still uh, need to provide more transparency and understanding on the type of measures which affect digital trade. Uh, still, there is uh, no uh, um, commonly agreed taxonomy. There is not commonly agreed definition on certain type of measures. So there is more to do on that front. And this is what we are trying also to work on. Uh, then, um, thanks to the initiatives like this, we can uh, create uh, uh, op options for comparison of, across countries and can conduct uh, quantitative analysis. And this is the most important point for us as a university and an institute working on policy because uh, through this data, what, what we want to do is then to conduct empirical exercises. And uh, uh, I've worked in the past with the indexes I presented before on some, on some of those analyses. We work on data uh, policy specifically, um, and uh, using the information of these databases, we could uh, uh, look at the empir empirically at how different types of measures impact different variables. We found that a certain type of uh, cross-border data policies can and uh, are, have restricted services trade. Uh, we also found that uh, uh, domestic uh, data policies can uh, re reduce productivity of companies. Um, and in our most, the most recent study we did uh, for the World Bank, what, uh, what we did was uh, to uh, starting from the database, dividing countries into three categories, whether they have an open regime on data, whether they have conditions applied to data flows, and whether they have a controlled regime, like the China approach. And uh, we could uh, empirically uh, then estimate the impact of these uh, regimes on uh, services. And we found that an open approach uh, provide, uh, is related to more trading services, the conditional approach of the EU is associated with more or less trade, depending on the sector we are looking at, while the approach followed uh, by China, for example, is always associated with less trade. And this is important data if we want to then provide the good uh, advices on, to policymakers. So uh, quickly presenting what, we, uh, what the project is about, uh, we have uh, created a network of experts uh, across different universities. Um, for now, uh, the universities are London School of Economics, ERT School, the e European University Institute, and Bocconi University. We meet uh, um, um, often to discuss these issues and to create a common understanding of these measures. Uh, and we are collecting data um, on to launch an open data set, thanks to the collaboration with the UN. Uh, and uh, already uh, we have heard about these uh, collective efforts before. And uh, we aim to develop an index uh, uh, through this, using the data we are collecting. Um, the, the partners of the initiative on top of the four universities are ESCAP in UNECA, but also UN ECLAC in Latin America, uh, ESIP, and also the uh, TISA network, uh, which is a network in Australia and um, Asia. Um, just very quickly showing what is a practical uh, implementation of uh, what we are, we are doing. Uh, we have uh, um, the regional digital trade integration is index developed with ESCAP. I will not go through the methodology, but just to tell you there is uh, several measures we look at. And uh, uh, with this index, we already have uh, uh, could uh, uh, map um, and create a ranking of countries based on their approach toward digital trade. Uh, we can then look, for example, how each country is doing compared with the regional average on uh, the different pillars we are looking at, and then easily spot uh, our where a country can uh, improve. Uh, and then uh, we, uh, we have uh, also uh, looked into similarity across measures, and this is all uh, data and tables you will find in the report of the UN. And uh, just and what we did was also to start discussing with the policymakers in certain countries and with the Philippines. Uh, the, there's a report also out uh, which uh, really used the data we collected to provide specific policy advices that was then uh, uh, well taken uh, and implemented um, well uh, with the interest or so intention to implement it uh, in the Philippines. Um, to conclude, uh, what we uh, are 
um, are doing with this project is uh, currently uh, we have kicked off the data collection um, and uh, in November we have started a webinar series. Uh, we had uh, meetings on data security. Next week we are having a webinar on data flows and then uh, more issues will be discussed in open webinars which are open to everybody. And uh, we aim to finalize data collection in March and uh, launch the index uh, in May and then start with the first annual report in September. If you want to know more about the, this initiative and if you want to know, join the webinars, join uh, our initiatives, you can uh, uh, Google our project uh, um, on, and you will also have a QR code to our website. Thanks. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much for that, Martina. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but that's okay, I guess. It's, uh, this is not a workshop with uh, um, a lot of uh, people banging down the door, uh, chopping at the bit, ready to, to talk, but uh, we do have a few minutes. Uh, are there any uh, people uh, participating who have not had a chance to speak thus far who would like to offer a comment, question, provocation, so on? If so, you can just type something into the chat or otherwise raise your hand in a way that Martina would notice. Um, we ought to be able to do that. I assume that the hand raising thing works. Yeah. Uh, what do they got set up here? Maybe it does not. Um, okay, if, the, if there are none, let me ask then uh, whether any of the uh, speakers uh, have any questions that they would like to ask each other. Uh, by way of clarification, uh, amplification, so on. Um, that would be, of course, interesting as well. Um, I'm sorry, so the, let me let me just ask the panelists, uh, since uh, nobody has a question to each other. I, I, I think what you're all doing is very interesting. And obviously there is uh, a, a very important case for trying to make, uh, gather this information and make it more comparable across cases and for networking the different initiatives together um, as as uh, we're starting here by having this session and what Martina is doing with multiple players involved as well. Um, I'm just wondering if, if people uh, see any path forward um, from these various initiatives in terms of linking them together more to uh, build a community of expertise and practice that can start to have some uh, salience politically with uh, the governments, the nego trade negotiators, but also with the governments more generally. I mean, how, how do we go about institutionalizing cooperation and making it count? We, we've seen this happen in the IGF. We've seen successful cases I've been involved in, for example, launching the Global Internet Governance Academic Network uh, back in 2006, but then we also had an effort to form a dynamic coalition on digital trade and it went nowhere. So, uh, you know, things go back and forth, but I'm just wondering, does anybody see possibilities here for trying to grow some collaboration and make it um, more, more uh, visible? Anybody have any thoughts? To me, I think it's really cool to see. I mean, Martina has been in this space for a very long time and nowadays she, she took the lessons that, yeah, we need, um, these aggregations that she's doing, she's doing the research together with our Eric and others. Uh, I think we are, for my initiative, we are trying to gather data and then help with such analyses because right now we are all about capturing data. I think the analyses that also Joffrey and, and Mithanda talked about that you create these indices and make it more salient to where the pressure points are. I think this is great. Um, it looks really good. And I hope we can map into it readily <laughs> as Martina indicated. <laughs> That'd be great, yeah. Um, I can add on, on our side, uh, from mm -hmm. the UI perspective, uh, we really see this as uh, the start of an exercise which aims eventually to uh, to reach out to policymakers and to try to create this uh, uh, more open uh, uh, community. And in our webinars, for example, we're always trying to reach out to people in different uh, stakeholder groups, inviting them to have a discussion so that we can really try to make it uh, uh, multi-stakeholder. Um, and uh, I think the, the collaboration with the UN is very important because they have a unique um, channel to discuss and, and talk and present uh, best practices to, 
policymakers. Um, and personally, I think uh, the experience with the UNSCAP and uh, the Philippines government has been uh, one of the most interesting uh, for me in my professional uh, experience because uh, it was really with a, a dark channel, thanks to the UN, to provide specific recommendation based on the study we did to policymakers that were involved in different ministries and different areas of the government. Um, and this is really what uh, what these st studies uh, uh, eventually dream to do, uh, not only with one government, uh, but with more. So th this is the, the mm -hmm. way to go for us. And we will keep doing empirical analysis to try to uh, then uh, identify best practices. That's excellent. Thanks a lot for that, Martina. Um, and yes, you have been a real catalyst here in this field, uh, uh, which has been really helpful to everybody. Um, would anybody else like to add something? Again, we're, we're running up towards the end. I don't know if IGF intends to shut it down, uh, the recording in one minute. Uh, any last thoughts from any of the other speakers? Jeffrey, Witanda, Witada, uh, anybody? Uh, I just want to, to add that uh, from, from UN perspective, especially as CAP, so what we are doing with, with the UI and uh, with other partners, uh, we are using it to communicate directly with the government. So uh, we, we run uh, expert group meeting. We invite government to, to understand the frameworks. And then uh, we have received a uh, request in uh, building the capacity for, for analyzing this, this issue more, more uh, into their policy uh, decisions. So, so that, that would uh, allow us to, to bring the evidence that we found also make them fit in directly into their policies. The, the Philippines that uh, Martina mentioned is the pilot countries, but uh, I do believe that uh, going forward, there will be more, more forum for, for, for us to, to reach it. That would be something to look forward to for everyone. All right, well, I think we, we are actually a minute over time. So uh, again, I, I apologize for a little bit of Zoom bombing there. Apparently that's been going around during this uh, IGF meeting and uh, what can you do? Hopefully it, it will be edited before uh, Hopefully, this sits, yes. sits on the web. Um, <laughs> so I wanna thank Martina for taking the initiative to organize this and for asking me to moderate it and to all of you panelists for participating and reporting on your very interesting research. I'm hoping that uh, there'll be a lot more conversations like this going forward and that we can all begin to work together in a collaborative manner to help build a, a, a global knowledge base that will be useful in informing uh, policy discussions because clearly it's it's needed. There's a lot of bad information out there, needless to say, um, and a lot of misconstructions out there. So good, solid uh, research-based uh, information is great. So thank you to everybody and uh, best of luck, happy trails, and see you uh, down the line somewhere. Thank you. Thank you, bye.